Hello and welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. Um, I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. All right, go. I am Alice Caldwell Kelly. I'm the person who's talking now. My pronouns are she and her. Yay, Liam. Yay, Liam. Hi, my pronouns are he and him. My name is Liam Anderson. Those those are very enthusiastic uh, introductions. <laughs> well, no, there. it's are God, God to gives be here? his hardest tummy aches <laughs> to his bravest soldiers. Aww, Liam, I'm, and, uh, I'm always sad when when you have um, what, what I like to call "I'm gonna fucking die" disease, um, which <laughs> has one symptom, which is tummy hurt. Um, tummy hurt. Yes, mm. it happened anywhere to, at, at any time to anyone. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes. And uh, what we're doing here is we are raising awareness for for victims and survivors of I'm gonna fucking die disease. Um, truly, the like the bravest people. Yes, and then and then and then what happens afterwards is you fart a lot, which is annoying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, you might. Yeah, I'm gonna um, blow out this hole. Sir. Anyway, it's, it's gonna yeah. And seen here, we have a picture of the second worst thing that can happen to you after tummy hurt, which is yes, um, a massive catastrophic plane crash. Yeah, being yes. scattered over a cornfield and runway. Uh, um, yes, which are in remarkably close proximity. I was gonna say someone's <sighs> someone's just been doing their like crops right next to a commercial airport runway. You couldn't do that now because of the terrorism, you know. Um, yeah, you might um, you know, you might ferment those that corn into ethanol and then use it as mm. sort of a fuel air bomb. You, you can know? you could be the kind of like tractor chud who like drives your tractor directly into a plane. Um, th this was not caused by chuds, so far as we know. No, no this was not caused by chuds. Um, what we are seeing here is the wreckage of United Airlines Flight Two Thirty Two. Um, mm -hmm. it's not supposed to look like that. Um, today we're going to learn all about the most horrific things that can go wrong with a plane and how four guys managed to not kill everyone. <laughs> yep. Yep. Laws, yes. laws of physics and uh, a shitload of mechanical failures versus four dudes and four, the four dudes, dudes kind yeah. of win. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, but before we talk about that, we have to do the goddamn news. Oh, some planes that are intact here. Yes, these are some planes that are intact. Um, so the FAA grounded every flight in the country on Wednesday for 90 sure minutes did. because their computer broke. Yep. Yeah, this was the notice to airmen system, right? The mm -hmm. one that tells you what shit's going on, where you don't want to be, the areas you're not allowed to like fly into because the Air Force is testing fucking cool hypersonic drones or whatever there. Um, yeah. And it just went offline. So because they couldn't issue you the safety instructions and uh, no flights, no flights today. No flights. Go home. Walk. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so this was something from like eight a.m. to nine thirty a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Are we in Eastern Daylight Time? I believe we're in Standard Time, right? I always I forget which is we're which. On standard Time. We're on Standard Time, right? Um, and and it's it's fun because we're enmeshing this with the modern airline industry where. You know, every plane turns around in like 45 minutes, especially the low cost carriers. So this 90 minute delay screwed up every plane in the country for like 12, 14 hours afterwards. Yeah. In, in terms of like consequences to commercial air travel in the short term, the, like we like the computer basically did 9-11. Yes. Um, it, it, it's cool. I mean, as we've seen, commercial air travel has a shitload of like very vulnerable bottlenecks. This is one of them. Um, yeah. More will come up in the course of this episode, in fact. Um, and I, I don't know Bottlenecks how you do like that. staying, staying in the air. Well, That's that too. Um, but he, here is one of these situations where you need the computer to work, and the solution, the fix, is make the computer not break ever. But as we know, yes. not always possible. Difficult to do, um, mm. but for a brief period of time, every airline became Southwest Airlines. Oh, man. <laughs> what a thought. Mm. Gladiatorial race to the bottom to see who can get to Orlando fastest. 
Yeah. I love this beautiful queue of airplanes just like idling, just uh, you know, raising the global temperature a little bit. Um, oh, this is actually this is actually from Gander during 9/11. Um, <laughs> same difference. I mean, <laughs> none yeah, of the, none been... of these were idling. They were all parked. Yeah. Well, this is still sort of a 9/11 bit of the computer. They did 9/11 yes. too. Truly, this is America's 9/11. <laughs> the commercial aircraft industry's 9/11. Yes. Uh, in other news, you're gay now. Obama's yeah, coming for your gas gay. stoves. No, you're gay now. He's mm-hmm. gonna he's gonna make your kitchen gay. Yeah. Yep. The uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, the federal agency with the most fun Twitter presence, uh, is is now cancelled. Um, mm-hmm. People are very mad yeah. at them. Um, why are people mad at them? Because Richard Trumka Jr., who's in charge of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, made uh, some remarks about we're going to see if we can make some safety improvements with regard to indoor air quality w- with gas stoves, right? And he said, well, up to and including, if necessary, banning them in new construction. Um, oh, yeah. And this has immediately been sort of uh, 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 cast as the new culture war issue. Right. Um which is, is your dad, you know, is your dad going to do the thing he did last time and stock up on gas stoves, Roz? No, because he has an electric stove. Oh, the thing yeah. about electric stoves is that they're, they're fine. They're, they're fine. Don't tell Roz but, that. But uh, I, <laughs> mine isn't. Um. <laughs> I have a gas stove. Uh, I mm. personally like to light cigarettes off of it uh, to really drive yeah, home the air quality wife. issues. Yeah. Oh, uh, this yeah. is this is the fun one. Is that I'm now on the wrong side of the culture war. So I'm going to probably become, by the end of this, by, by the end of this year, I'm going to be like a turf. I'm going to yeah, like be a st- QAnon guy. Pronouns. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to yeah, have yeah. to, I'm going to have to, my pronouns are Patriot and Jesus. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, because we know that, uh, like, uh, gas is, natural gas is pretty bad to just be having around. Um, I, I think the statistics are that, it, like, gas stoves cause some percentage of childhood asthma. Um, I read that study earlier today. It's sort of this the statistical analysis, which I, I I'm going to be honest. I think I think the the indoor air pollution risks here are kind of overblown, especially if you got a modern stove that doesn't have a pilot light, you know, and has more complete combustion than something from you know 1970. Um, the, you know, the, and the you can crack scientists. a window. I mean, woke scientists are trying to take your grill away. Um, yeah, to, I, I take I, away I, your ability to properly char meat. Yeah, exactly. I can understand if you're you're using something that's like really old, has a pilot light constantly going, probably sure. leaking methane into your kitchen, all that sort of stuff. That um, you know, that, that's going to be that's going to be pretty bad for you. But like, I can't imagine that if you have like a really modern stove, it's it's going to be that bad. You know, it, it, at worst case scenario, crack a window. So I I oh. I. I I think this is what's what you're really gonna have come out of this is not gonna be a gas stove ban, but maybe some standards as to like complete combustion in gas stoves, so on and so forth. What's fun is the culture war side of this, as you've identified, is yeah. leading. Um, I keep talking about cat turd two lately, which is stupid of me, but yeah, the cat turd two take on this right now is I'm turning all of my gas. Stove like uh, burners on. Yeah, I'm leaving the Sylvia on. Plath myself inadvertently. Yeah, right? yeah, uh, yeah. In order to like trigger you, the libs, and there's nothing you can do about it. And it's like, I'm, I, I, I've been triggered by a lot of things, but I don't think I'm triggered by that. You, no, it's your, it's um, your no, energy. No, I think that's and, that's just sort of a dumb thing to do. <laughs> and like your lungs or whatever. Like, I'm, I, I'm yeah, not even I'll tempted right, to do the right. kind of like liberalism smug thing of being like, well, at least I got the vaccine, so when your dumbass ends up in the hospital, then I, I told you so. I don't even need to do that, because I'm like, it's just your problem. It's in your house. It, it, it's just, just a very stupid very thing to do. Very yeah, yeah, stupidity, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you just do whatever. Right. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna yeah. go ahead and burn your house down, whatever, right? Please. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you want to gas yourself, then yeah, be my guest. It's, yeah. It doesn't inconvenience me in any way whatsoever. Um, but you know, it's it's because of pronouns or whatever. That, right, right, probably. It's, yeah, it's my, your my, fault. My, my yeah, pronouns yeah, are true. natural and gas. Actually, um, actually, uh, yeah. you know, in, in my spare time, I break into people's houses and I take their gas stoves and like unhook them and replace them with a new electric stove with the, with the um, induction stove. Well, that's uh, going to be the other thing. Is even like, worse, yeah. 
Well, yeah, and that's the other thing is like you're 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 looking at a situation where if they ban gas stoves, uh, every landlord in the country is gonna you know they're gonna install the shittiest electric stove possible. Oh, yeah. Rather than like a nice induction stove or something that yeah, you're not can actually match stove. the performance, you are, you, know? you are getting the junkyard special that doubles as you're, a washer. Yeah, you're mm. you're getting the shitty coil thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're getting the stove my my grandma Agnes had in the house in in Boston when I was a kid, when I was a kid. Mm. That, yeah, that only, was haunted. Yeah, I mean the, the it has only a problem, dial, but it only has two settings on and yeah, off. It, yeah, you don't really need it. To, <laughs> <laughs> the dial the is just with, to make it stand out at, at Sears, really. Yeah, I mean the only problem with the induction stoves is you got to have a separate little pan so that the bottom of it actually heats your your mocha pot yeah. that you use for your coffee, or at least I use. Um, if, use if you don't have, I mean, no. Okay. Yeah, because it's it's cool. It's an it's a design stuff. Right. It's elegant. Okay. It's all right. like time. I, I also so, have one. You. It's very, yeah. it's a really you, yeah. You too. And I, I also have a tiny pan I have to use for the moment. It's really annoying. Yeah. It's you really two yeah, it are annoying. the worst. Are the worst yeah. people in the world. Mm, uh-huh. Sometimes I, I, you just I, I have, have to have two. a tiny coffee. I, I have two. I, I have I one for my I'm tiny coffees because I I have one that's like the mocha pot that has like a cow print on it that you use for milk drinks. That right, that's, that's cute. I like that. <laughs> it's I'll adorable. Concede, yeah. I'll concede that yeah. I like the mocha pot. Mm-hmm. Yes. Some days you just have to start your day off with a tiny coffee. And I don't think I've ever seen way. you drink a giant coffee. I believe the only size of oh. coffee I've ever seen you drink are jumbo and enormous. No, mm. I, I sometimes I do tiny coffee now too. Oh, that's a, sometimes I do culture. tiny coffee. Sometimes I do tiny coffee and a big coffee. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Really just the, yeah. yeah. Have like this courses in your coffee. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm. But this is made more difficult by my electric stove. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you, if you had you, a gas what stove, what happened to the kettle? To like... Oh, I took the kettle with me, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. You want an electric kettle? I think I have an extra. Well, that's not how tiny coffee works. Mm. We'll just... you, you put the water in the mocha pot. Yeah, and then you heat then, it from below. Oh, no, I was just heat asking it from below, in general. Yeah. No, I, I because the I, thing about I making coffee, not to get James Hoffman. Yeah. Actually, yeah, we should, to say. should see if we get James Hoffman on the thing because I really like his yeah. uh, his content. But yeah, so uh, you got to like the, force... he's the coffee guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to like yeah. force yeah. um like uh hot water through a bed of sort of like compressed coffee, and then that's yes. what gets you the the espresso. Um, right. It's like a, it's it's a, it's a function of like heat pressure. Um, sure. And, yeah, it's it's uh, a bunch I of. I use the Chemex. Oh, was that a big breath in? Was that the was that a big <laughs> Alice breath in? Was that what that was? You got opinions, I, there, lady? No, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I respect Poro. Let's hear it. I respect Poro. All right, I do. I just I don't think it's as uh as, as nice of a sort of an affectation as my finicky little aluminium. Italian coffee bullshit that I gotta disassemble and like wipe clean and dry after every use. Um, I I think this might be the angriest I've ever been on the show. I I'm gonna be honest. Most days I just use the seven dollar Mister Coffee drip machine. Yeah, you know, and that that me, thing me that thing is. I when I say I use a yeah, Chemex, so I fucking don't. My, I do my roommate, my roommate, <laughs> my roommate bought that in like 2012, and I still have it. <laughs> yeah, that's my yeah. favorite thing is all the shit we stole from them. Yes. Uh um, although they <laughs> hey man, they they took my crock pot, so mm-hmm. there you go. No, before, this before was, seeing the light. This was the before pot, that even. Did, like, I know it was. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, um so anyway, um official Obama's podcast gonna make position your kitchen gay, right? Is yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the story of Obama making your kitchen gay. Um and that, that was, was the goddamn news. The goddamn coffee. I like this. I like coffee talk. Yeah. Nice little yes. sort of interstitial. Um, it's coffee time. <laughs> but we got to talk about the extremely low resolution logo here of the McDonnell Douglas Corporation. Um, I like the, we, the, the. Is it a shark? Is it a B two bomber? Is it a? That's a that's a weird sort of like future plane and a space. Oh, uh, the America bomber. Yes. Mm-hmm. First, yeah, we have the, to ask, what is McDonnell Douglas? And the answer yeah. is, it's a cheat code in SimCopter that gives you all the helicopters <laughs> is it really <laughs> yes you type in i'm the ceo of mcdonald douglas yeah you do and it gives you all the helicopters huh interesting yeah so <laughs> mcdonald douglas <laughs> was um uh used to used to be a uh like a aerospace corporation it's now it merged with boeing in like the 90s i want to say 
Um, but it used to be a large uh, aer aerospace corporation and defense contractor. And it exists because of, you may have heard of the Martin Aircraft Corporation, made a lot of like fighters and stuff in, in the Second World War. Um, Glenn Martin, who was in charge of that, had these two protégés, McDonnell and Douglas. They each went off to found their own corporations. Um, and essentially, both of their companies, the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation and the Douglas Aircraft Company, had grown hugely during World War II. Like, their, their workforce had expanded, you know, 10, 20, 50-fold, because they had all these military contracts. Um, uh, like, Douglas made, uh, like, transport aircraft and, like... Um, uh, what's the name of the fucking seaplanes, shit like that. Um, and so when World War II ended, the US didn't need all this shit anymore, and they still had all of these employees, and the business thinking at the time was that you couldn't shrink a company, you couldn't downsize, that just didn't happen. You just had to keep yes. all of these people on the payroll forever. Um, and so they had to try and maintain that, that wartime size in peacetime. Um, and McDonald's maybe the more interesting one. They were really heavily into like military stuff. They did a lot of guided missiles. Um, they did the F4 Phantom, beautiful plane that will come up in the next episode. Um, they also did a lot of space stuff. They uh, they did a lot of the early Mercury program, which leads me to their slogan, which is the most copium thing I've ever heard. Their slogan was the first free man in space. My grandfather wow. worked on the Mercury program. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, okay, Gagarin might have beaten us to it, but have you considered? But that... he's a commie, so he, yeah, yeah, exactly. He couldn't. He didn't have the freedom to vote for George Wallace, right? And so therefore, he could not engage in free enterprise in space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, his his ship probably wasn't even made by the lowest bidder. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, and so. McDonnell has all of these military and space contracts, but they're very fickle. They're kind of unpredictable. Um, like, the US military kind of like gets into wars, it gets out of wars, it needs stuff, it doesn't need stuff, it changes its mind. Um, and they didn't know that Vietnam was coming over the horizon and was going to like guarantee them a shitload of income. So they're like uh, very unstable in that sense. Douglas, the Douglas Aircraft Company, um, because they made cargo planes and like transport planes, it was a logical leap for them to get into airliners. Um, and so they make those, they're trying to compete with Boeing, um, but not very successfully. And they have this new expensive design kind of in mind. We'll meet that shortly. Couldn't pay for it. Couldn't pay for anything really. They're like less than a year from bankruptcy. Um, they produce airliners like jet airliners, the uh, DC eight and the DC nine, but they're way behind schedule because they don't have any money. Um, and so McDonald comes to them to, to be like, okay, well, we Maybe also have no money. <laughs> yeah, well, sort yeah. of. It's McDonald has right. money, but like no sustainability, no consistency. Douglas right. has consistency, but no money. Um, and so they merge in 1967 to create the McDonnell Douglas Corporation. And this is a remarkably successful merger. Like it really is the best of both worlds. Um, and it, it sort of sets the blueprint for a lot of American manufacturing in that. You kind of you wed the civilian and the military in a way that, like, for instance, Boeing is very successfully able to do, or like Lockheed Martin is yes. very successfully able to do, um, where you have the two sides oh. of the business, and when you don't have money to like do the military stuff, the civilian side funds that, and vice versa. Um, and so, within a couple of years of their merger in in sixty seven, all of this is turned around, and they are ready to push their big new expensive dream project. Next slide, please. Beautiful trijets. Yeah, mm. you love a trijet. You love a trijet. I, I have a soft spot for them too. They're so inelegant. The but this is this is their thing. This is the you guys BC hear that? 10. Hear what? Can you hear what I believe to be uh, uptown funk? I cannot hear uptown funk. Oh, I I hear a little bit of uptown. A funk. A little bit. How bad is it? Do I need to shut my door? Is my question. Uh, I think you're fine. Yeah, you should be fine. If you're if you're like in doubt, then I guess just get up and do yeah, it. Yeah, it's bothering the shit of me. I'll be right back. Okay. You get like a little like podcasting studio, you know, build some sound yeah. barriers around your uh, around he, your. He studio. does have a he does have a podcasting studio. Needs to soundproof the podcasting studio. <laughs> just just like what you want to do is you want to do as I do and just fill that room entirely with like various of crap. Um, yes. Just like stuff you accumulate. 
And then that has a great sound deadening sort of uh, prophecy. It's going to become true, sort of like yeah. a, a like a minor hoarder. Um, oh well, that's already me. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, this, I mean this is the, the my, my podcast. Maybe. My podcast room is also um is also a uh, room where I store everything that doesn't fit in the rest of the apartment. Starting to think that something about podcasters, we maybe are not the most sort of like uh, mentally healthy or good at adulting people. Sure uh, no. That. That's why, that's why none of us have normal jobs except Liam. <laughs> <laughs> the, most, the most normal member of, of Well Leisure Problem Incorporated. Um, this is true, yes. <laughs> Shut up. It's weird. This plane looks kind of like out of proportion to me as I'm looking at it. It looks like too it small. Does. It looks uh, a little bit shorter than it should be, you know? Uh, like I guess squished. that's... Squished. Yeah. Because it is the oldie plane. Or it could be a horrible accident that this plane underwent and they had to cut out the middle. <laughs> They've done a cut and shut on this, yeah. Yeah, it's just exactly. Like they, they do it really obviously on the livery, so it just says, like, Aiken, because they <laughs> yes. cut out, like, three rows of seats and a door. Yeah, that's where it, uh, that's where it accordioned in after colliding with a terminal. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, when you get on a commercial airline, you want to check the VIN number on the chassis. At both yes. ends to make sure that it matches. Um, yeah. Contact the friendly member of the ground crew. <laughs> <laughs> Ask if you can walk around the plane before I you mean, get on. <laughs> they'll probably let you do it. Like I mean, I know they like do vetting and stuff, but in I I have never met an aircraft like an air an airport ground crew staff member who ever gave a single fuck about anything. And <laughs> you know what? It works most of the time. So that that's yes. a good arrangement. Um, <laughs> I saw a video of um, uh, Qantas baggage handlers a while back, but like literally, not not just throwing bags in like that's the most efficient way to move the bags. Right. But one of them picking up a suitcase overhand, slamming that I shit down that. like a wrestler. Oh, I saw that one. Yeah. It's like no, the only reason to do that is spite, and I love that. If you don't want your shit pl broken, planes gotta don't get, put it don't in check baggage. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the plane's got to get loaded. My God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like the people being like uh, that. Something no one ever seems to consider is like, yo, oh, we we can't have bags <coughs> over more than fifty pounds, but they don't weigh the passengers. And it's like, yeah, once for OSHA, dumbass. Yeah, yeah. M Track also has a fifty pound rule, and I was confused about that to start out with because I was like, oh, trains are pretty heavy, baggage is not that heavy. Then I realized, oh wait, this is for the people who have to handle the luggage so they yeah. don't get a hernia. Workplace protections. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the the only way to solve this is to palletize everybody's uh, luggage. Yes. I I forgot Cornelius mm. Van der Raas. Uh, it's yes. it's nice to meet you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so this is this is Lockheed. Fuck, not Lockheed Martin. This is McDonnell Douglas's mm -hmm. big yeah, new. Yeah. Uh, Lockheed had the other one. Yeah, <laughs> tried yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with the the curvy engine. <laughs> I I'm sure Raz has mentioned it already. Uh, I couldn't. I I for some reason wasn't uh, able to unmute myself for a bit, but. The uh, this American paint scheme, uh, a personal favorite of mine. The kind of that was a superior one. one for a long time until they went with gray instead. I uh, dude, I was flying. Was I flying the other day? Yeah, because I flew to and from Jacksonville. I I I will say, like, I have I have sort of gotten over flying as like an absolutely miserable experience. But it's just like it sucks, dude. Like it's just yeah. like it's just mm. like. Ugh. Like, you know what I mean? It's very yeah, bad. I mean, <laughs> like, fine. Like, I'll just get on the plane, but like, I'm not going to be fucking happy about it. Yes. I'm, I am I I tend to find that the sort of, like, quotidian anxieties and annoyances of air travel don't really dent me so much because I'm too terrified that I'm going to die. Um, I'm, like, I'm too busy with my cavewoman brain being, like, why is the room moving? Why is the room moving fast? Why is it tilting upside sure, down? Sure, right. We're gonna yeah. slide backwards and fall out of the fucking sky. I'm, um, gonna, I'm gonna accidentally push the button on the seat that makes the engine fall yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why is no one else screaming? Uh, did all, all, all of these things? So you know, I, I, I guess that's why I'm not mad at like screaming children and stuff because I get it. You know, they're smart. Yes. If you're smart. You'd be screaming too. Um, So, right, what is this I don't thing? Know, I, what is this thing? Well, you, I believe, 
Did I write this one? You wrote this one, yeah. I wrote this one. Wrote it's fine. I can, I, I can, I can, I can commandeer it and fly. So I guess this is. Uh... Oh yes. Oh, welcome aboard. <laughs> yeah. so welcome yeah. to the flight deck, Captain. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, Kelly. Fly, fly, fly me to Cuba. No, it's not a Muslim thing. Why would you ask me that? Uh, so, this is this is <laughs> McDonnell Douglas's big new flagship project. It was originally Douglas's big new flagship project, but they didn't have the money to do it until they are uh, merged with McDonnell. This is the DC-10. Um, yes. And as you may notice, it has one, two, three engines, one placed sort of in an ungainly fashion on the tail. I would not um, call that ungainly. I would call that arousing. Mm. Perhaps even erotic. I, I wow. would say some, some things that are ungainly can be erotic. Um, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's uh, uh, OnlyFans coming soon. Um, mm-hmm. But so, so, so back back in fifty three, the FAA implemented this thing called the sixty minute rule, right? That flight paths of airliners must be constructed in such a way that at all times the airliners are no more than sixty minutes from an airport in case of an engine failure or some similar emergency. But yeah, it's still, still a thing. That's why. Engines. Yeah. But this is why they introduced like uh, the most recent generation of like extended operations, ETOPS uh, or XOPS or whatever. Uh, like two, you can fly across the Atlantic in like a two-engine plane now, which you never yeah. used to be able to do because they they required that you have four engines so that if you know two of them fail, you still have two engines. Um, yes, I only need one. Good luck to you. <laughs> yeah, well, same difference here. If you're flying like across the U.S., there's no reason for you to be like you have to be 60 minutes from an airport if you've got four engines because it's more engines than you know what to do with, and like one of them keeps the plane up long enough to be like safely diverted somewhere. So. You can just kind of fuck around with it, you know, do whatever. Yes. Yeah. But, you, you know. In oh, 1964, this what, restriction was lifted for aircraft with more than two engines, right? Because they had another engine, so it was sort of the, the regulation changed. So now you could have theoretically three engines and be able to do these transatlantic flights, right? Which means all of a sudden there's this big market for these things called trijets. Ross, what's that ridiculous plane you like with like fourteen engines? It doesn't narrow it down. There's a million engines. Yeah, six hundred and four burning. Oh, the um, uh, that's a B thirty six. Yeah, I I was yeah. thinking B twenty six. I think that all flights should be required to be done in modified B thirty sixes. That would be pretty funny. <laughs> Noisy as fucking shit. Two hundred and thirty uh, foot wingspan, baby. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's she's not a light girl, but she's got it where it counts. Mm. So, so it, for the, like a large plane, you can save money because four engines consumes more fuel than three engines. It's heavier, yes, more unwieldy, yeah. requires more maintenance, all of this shit. Yes. So you want to try and like downsize uh, even your like sort of longer flights to to trijets if you can to save money. Yeah. So a lot of your early trijets are shorter range ones. They had the Hawker Siddeley Trident. Boeing 727, but a large trijet was clearly a pretty economical option over something like, you know, a four-engine Boeing 707. Mm -hmm. um, Lockheed tried to enter the market first with the L-1011. That's the one with the curvy engine. But McDonnell Douglas jumped ahead of them with the DC-10, which was cheaper but technically inferior, right? Yeah, they kind of they stole a march on them. They sold a shitload of them to um, uh, American and United well, pretty much before uh, Lockheed could like even go and market this to anyone. Like Don Draper goes to see American, and uh, you know already they've bought thirty of these DC tens or whatever. Yes. So you, you you got three engines here. There's one under each wing. There's a third one in the tail. Airlines had their choice of engines. You could get them from Pratt and Whitney, or you could get them from GE, as opposed to the L ten eleven, which only used Rolls Royce engines. Um, it's, it's weird. Oh, airlines, Rolls airlines have like Rolls, Rolls Royce. Uh, airlines have these weird preferences about engines, which is something that we'll get into in a minute. Like even when they're sort of like technically like almost interchangeable. Do they have like preferential contracts? Is that I I, I think contribute to it? Yeah, I mean some some of it's that I some of like national, think so, right? Like, well, sorry, go ahead. National stuff like uh American oh, sure. carriers will want to buy GE, like British Airways has always gone Rolls Royce, stuff like that. Um and there's a reason. Yeah, a shitload of like horse trading on the side as well. 
I imagine parts commonality helps as well. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. But so they end up with these like individual preferences, uh, which yeah. is, is is nice for like aircraft manufacturers to be able to accommodate. Now, the, the the big problem is this market for these wide body trijets turned out to be smaller than expected. Neither the DC-10 nor the L-1011 made too much money for their respective designers. Yeah, in fact, to the point where Lockheed completely exited the airliner business is entirely. There reason? Um, do we know why they didn't make money, or is it like a combination of of things? Is a small market and too many too many people competing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, it's kind of not as much of a margin as pe as you'd like you'd expect. Like yeah. I, I set out this sort of the case for it on like you know for for engines consumes more fuel. So not that much. Like not enough to really make a difference. And I would I would imagine the consumer airline market because the airlines aren't going to say yes I'm okay with I'm okay with being ripped off to a point where the Department of Defense says please daddy harder <laughs> yeah for sure i mean that's something we'll get into in the the, the bonus episode but um yeah sure, it's recording like this, tomorrow the, after i've put in 40 49 hours at work that's right should be yeah. great um right but yeah the, the sort, of, sort of like a, a long trend towards consolidation of bigger planes that right. culminates in the end with yeah. the 747 um that's a lot of, a lot of your uh domestic airlines at this point they don't really have uh whatchamacallit um you know they don't have the transatlantic routes american and uh united you know they are they're stuck with domestic flights and oh, pan yeah. am is you know bought up all these big 747s you know, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, but the dc-10 proves to be more popular than the l-1011 uh, but quickly develops this really bad reputation for safety with stuff like the cargo door blows out in flight, Saves weight. An, an engine yeah. falls off, Saves uh, weight. you know, what stuff are, well, like how that. How are these problems, yeah. Ross? You're not, you're not yeah. describing, you're giving me solutions, buddy. You're giving me solutions. It's it's sort of one of those one of those things where the failures you have might not kill anybody, and it certainly might not lead well, to like whole loss. They don't look good loss. at the very least. Well, 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 no, they, they no, do kill. They do kill people. That that too. <laughs> but even even when they don't, there's something about the sort of the phrase uh, parts exiting or parts departing the aircraft during mm -hmm. flight that catches your attention. It's generally not a good thing. Um, now we talk about the GE CF6 engine. Uh, incredible Down here. guy here. Well, yeah, there's a the guy, this. yeah. The, the guy. He's this got this a, is what engineering got a, used to look like. Yeah, you used to get a coat with a name tag on it. Roz, you should get a coat with a name tag. We yeah. should all get coats with name tags on them. Oh, that'd be great, it's all, yeah. It's all British shock front. coats. Corinne's learning yeah. crochet and is trying to make Roz and I custom crochet high vis. Ooh. Delightful. All right, so this is what you call a high bypass turbo fan, right? So your early, your early jet aircraft were powered by turbo jets, but that has a problem, right? Which is the turbo jet has a very high exhaust velocity. Um, so even when you're when you're going, that's fine if you're going fast. Hmm. But if you're Something going you slow, want like military aircraft, right? Yes, or, and if you're if you're going maneuverability slow, is a big deal. Yeah. yeah, if you're going slow, it's very fuel inefficient because um, you're just have that. sending all this air at the back, which you know is accelerating you from zero miles an hour to seven miles an hour, and all that stuff's going out the back at five hundred miles an hour. Right? Um, you know, it's not ideal. Do the words vent to atmosphere mean anything yeah. to you? <laughs> so, when you're traveling at slower speeds, you need something that can have a slower exhaust velocity, which results in the turbo fan, right? So, Same here with this sort of giant fan on the front. There's a big, big fan in the front, yeah. yes. So, there's it's a turbo fan. You have a turbo jet in the back, which is optimized not for thrust but for spinning a shaft. Um, and it's relatively small. Um, and that shaft drives the exactly. big fan. So the majority of the air that goes in the engine does not go into the jet. It goes through the fan and goes sure. around the jet, thereby leading to a lower exhaust velocity, more efficiency, more thrust for less fuel. Right. Okay. Um, but one effect of this is that the engines need a large diameter, which means you have a large fan that operates at a very high speed, 
which means every fan blade is subject to very high stresses, right? I mean, you, you see here, is this thing like a... running on like a, a a belt of some kind? No, it's just runs a on a shaft. 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 Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I yeah, didn't know if, if it had both or, or one or the other. I'd, yeah, uh, it's like a like I a can do car belt. engine. I can't do uh, I can't do aircraft a, engine. Actually, so, but like if this guy is like five to six feet tall, this is like a yeah, it's know, a big boy, se like a it's seven a or eight boy. foot diameter sort of fan. Right. Uses uses like a sort of uh, like a piston and arm system, like a steam locomotive. You know? Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> oh, that was a joke. God damn it! Yeah. <laughs> I don't know engines. Sorry, folks. I only know car engines. So no, this end... is like th that's yeah. the thing about jet engines. It's kind of remarkable how few parts all of them have. Like. There's a lot of intricate stuff going on there, but mostly in stuff that's like in a handful of like mechanically simple assemblies. It's weird as hell. What happening. you drinking, Roz? I have a shape of hops to come. Oh, nice. I've got yeah. a a Costco brand sparkling water. See, I'm 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 I've reduced my alcohol consumption to two beers a day. That yeah, does not shape. mean that does not mean they have to be light beers, though. No, listen, I'm <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> I just had so, a mango lassi, so you know. Just didn't oh, take that good choice. Yeah, yeah, because I had a car. Yeah. So the ends of the fan blades on these high bypass turbo fans, you know, they easily exceed the speed of sound. Right. the The centrifugal force here is like sixty tons per blade. So fight in the comments about whether that's real. Uh, we yeah. don't care. Exactly. So you need a very heavy duty piece of metal in the middle, the fan disc. Uh to keep everything in place, right? And a complicating factor here is, of course, all of these fan blades are consumables. So you have to be able to replace them, right? You can't just weld them on there. Um, oh, what's that attitude? <laughs> because of all this, and because uh, weight is important, um, you build all this stuff out of titanium, right? Which is this sort of notoriously difficult to work with and very temperamental material, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll I put talk on a more whole about slide that about that, yeah. yeah. Um, so this, this CF-66 uh, six, six is derived from an earlier turbo fan on the C-5 Galaxy military cargo aircraft. That was the really, oh, really big one. G give well, it, give it to the Air Force first, see if it kills people there. If it doesn't, yeah. then it's good for civilians. Uh, I found out yesterday Lockheed tried to make a civilian version of it. Uh, the L five hundred, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the 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 marketing that's an line American, was American like Maria. That's an American AN two two five. Oh yeah, that was uh the, the 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 marketing for it was like oh yeah you can book a ticket to Europe and bring your car and your luggage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was supposed to be like been? a thousand people, right? <laughs> yeah, Jesus, yeah. three decks. <laughs> <laughs> Give wow. me a sort of towering inferno style movie set on one of those. You know, one of the launch customers would have been Executive Jet Airlines of Penn Central fame. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> anyway, R return. Um, yes. Yeah, so the uh, this was derived from a turbo fan on the C five Galaxy. Uh, radically increased the range, fuel efficiency of airliners, and made possible many routes which were otherwise e uneconomical. And it was the engine of choice for United Airlines. But first, we must ask ourselves, what is what is United Airlines? All right, so, so the there's fun fact All about right, so this. So imagine a dumpster. Now imagine <laughs> that dumpster on fire. Now imagine Roz, fourteen beers in, on a flight somewhere, clutching at his seat nervously and saying, "I should have taken the train." And we're about I, there. I, I. Listen, you I, don't fly I, United, do I, you? No, I do fly United. Oh, you do? That's right. Yes. Because, yeah. Oh, yeah. buddy. <laughs> buddy. Oh. Fun, fact about, fun, fact about, a moron. fun fact about this episode is I was writing it, but I got distracted while I was writing it and wrote episode 99, the airmail scandal. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. You were like, hey, it's, this is going. Yeah, it completely like, <laughs> grabbed you. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> So I initially, that was a lot funnier. <laughs> so, so initially, there was this kind of like primitive accumulation that happened with uh, with airlines, right? Where um, uh, aircraft and like aircraft parts manufacturers, namely Boeing and Pratt and Whitney, uh, Boeing made made airframes, Pratt and Whitney made engines, were buying up these like fledgling air transport companies. It was mostly freight. It was mostly like we will fly your mail or whatever uh, with some passenger stuff. 
that like flying passenger was miserable because it was like an open cockpit and shit like that. Um, and as we know, having that sort of like integrated production chain, manufacturing your own planes, that's very lucrative. It's very efficient. Which is it sucks if you want to preserve some semblance of a free market, right? Like it's it's a monopoly. It's purely a monopoly in that sense. Actually, it's a monopsody, I believe. Um, and so uh, Boeing and Pratt and Whitney and all of these uh, like fledgling air companies uh, sort of like formed into this conglomerate UATC, the United Aircraft and Transport Corporation. Um, and this is this is diabolical. Fine. Uh, until the airmail scandal happens, watch the episode, not going to explain it twice, um, and Congress passes the oh, Airmail Act of 1934, which sort of breaks up by fiat. That, like, the idea is you cannot have uh, an aircraft manufacturer and an airline in the same company. You have to split them off as like an antitrust measure, um, which is what they do. And so UATC, the, um, like the plane bit comes Boeing, more or less, uh, and the airline bit becomes United Airlines, um, which grows steadily into this national carrier. I have one detail that was too good not to include, and this is verbatim from the Wikipedia. From 1953 to 1970, United operated six-day-a-week afternoon non-stop extra fare men-only flights between New York and Chicago, the Chicago Executive, and Los wow. Angeles and San Francisco, on which women and children were banned. Advertised Incredible. as a club in the sky, they featured cocktails, oh. steak dinner, and cigar and pipe smoking permitted. Incredible. Um, I, I, there's not a lot that I miss about masculinity, but being able to light up a cigar on the Chicago executive. Yep. yep. <laughs> I retire. I just. You don't I... need if you don't. Hey, I know we were talking about air quality like ten minutes ago, but you don't need it. Shut up. <laughs> all I all I can think of is the poor stewardesses on that flight. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, God. oh Jesus! Yeah. Doesn't bad thinking about not, that's not going to no, be good. That's bad. That's that's no. why. And that's yeah. why we give every stewardess a spear gun. <laughs> Unruly passengers. They're, they're, they're um incidentally one of United's claim to fame is uh, that they claim to have invented the idea of a stewardess. Um. Okay, that's just a, a a servant, really, in the air. That's yes. not, that's yeah, but the they claim to have hired, hired the first one. Um, but so in, in 1968, United buys at launch 30 DC-10s with an option on another 30 if they like them, which they do, and they take that option. They buy 60 and all. Um, but when they do that, it's still intended to be a domestic airplane because United's a domestic carrier. United doesn't have an overseas flight until 1983. Um, the reason why for this, by the way, is that um, uh, for a long time, um, like routes internationally were assigned by the federal government. Um, ultimately, a bunch of airlines would sue the Eisenhower administration in something called the Trans-Pacific Route Case uh, for the right to fly to Japan, fly to Australia. And what the federal government ended up doing was going, okay, well, we're not going to like allow you to just operate those freely. We'll still award them, but we'll award them to some other people. Um, and, nah, 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 like, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah, like Pan Am wins big on that. TWA wins big on that. Uh, but both United and American get absolutely rat fucked on it. Um, United, <laughs> United really wants to fly to Japan, uh, and they're left with like just Hawaii, which isn't that profitable. Um, and I love what the federal government is petty. Oh yeah. Hundred percent, and so that means you can go to such you know glamorous destinations as uh, you know Bakersfield or whatever on United. Ooh, Dubuque. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> Dubuque's nice. Uh, top of Goliath, there, man. Uh, so you can fly doesn't to Dubuque have uh, an inclined plane? Inclined plane, or is that I, Des Moines? I forget. I Ow, believe that's maybe. Des Moines. I mean, I'm, right, I'm, yeah. I'm not even joking because United's one of one of their other big marketing things was like they would fly to all fifty states. Um, uh, we and, will take your dumbass anywhere. Yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and so United is stuck in the U.S., locked in, and one of their pushes to like try and uh, economize and grow more is to deregulate the airline industry because the airline industry yeah. is still run by a sort of like 
FDR um, New Deal kind of thing, where the civil, FDR the for civil, beyond the grave. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Like this sort of the zombie thing we regulator have to fear yeah. is declining leg room itself. <laughs> yes, it's uh, the the Civil Aviation Board, the CAB, that like administers airlines. And if you want to fly a new route, if you want to fly to I don't know Denver from New York, you have to go to the the commercial airline board. Uh, where they will, and this is a true example, lose the file for seven years and then turn you down because the file is now out of date. Good. Um, this, good. this is one of those things where you know someone posts like a picture on uh, on Twitter about like uh, how how nice and luxurious flying used to be, and then some globe emoji guy uh, replies in the comments, "Well, aren't you happy now that flying is so cheap that it's accessible to the masses? You wouldn't have been able to afford that flight." And I'm kind of like. I don't use planes anyway. Yeah, because yeah, they're yeah, too yeah. miserable. <laughs> yeah, but, but but the Civil Aviation Board really had a premium on that kind of return shit. So there was somebody at the time who was concerned about like people wearing suits to go on the airplane and like having yeah. a lot of leg room and having a steak dinner. Um, and airlines fucking hated it because it was too expensive and it stopped them from doing what they wanted to do, which is pack people in cheap yeah, yeah. and then yes. fly them, you know, like cattle to the Buick, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I will say, uh, listeners, listeners at all, for 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 a little bit of context, Roz and I and two of our friends are going to New Orleans. Uh, the three of three of us are flying. Don't drink a hand myself. Uh, I'm gonna do it anyway, Alice. Don't. Do that to uh, and uh, and Roz is not flying, so he gets there like nine hours after the rest of us do. And I look forward to the crescent more, being more likely of... nine hours before. I might just take an extra day. <laughs> uh, well, ha- you know, get your own hotel. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't don't drink a hand grenade. Um, oh, Ross, bad news. You and I are rooming on that trip. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. I'll buy you your plugs. Get 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 the travel recording things and record, even if you ha- do have a hand grenade. Oh, um, we can. <laughs> Yo, live from New Orleans. Yes, oh, yes. I regret it already, but that's a good idea. Um, so U- United ends up winning. Like this is an early, well, not early, but this is a huge victory of lobbying. They get the Airline Deregulation Act passed in 1978, um, which basically says, "Fuck it, do whatever you want." Abolishes the CAB. Um, it keeps the FAA uh, and like safety rules and stuff, which is nice. But basically, everything else is fucked, and you can just do whatever you want. Um, which leads to them flying everywhere, packing people in cheap. Number of airline passengers goes up. Uh, labor conditions get worse. A bunch of small airlines go bankrupt and get eaten. Um, and some of the big ones too, which is what happens to Pan Am. Um, Pan yes. Am eats shit in 1985. Gets bought out by United. And that's when they start flying internationally as like sort of as, as zombie Pan Am, um, and somehow ooh. the the trademark is passed to the the Guilford Rail System of New England, um, very which very becomes strange. becomes Pan Am Railroad. <laughs> they ate it last year, right? They ate it last year. They got completely bought out by CSX. <laughs> uh, the 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 Chessy system cat, you know, conquers all. Um, Yes. All of which takes us to 1989, um, which is... Which I think is personally Taylor Swift's best album. Now, yeah. he'll allow me to... <laughs> <laughs> See, I like this livery better than the toothpaste one. It doesn't have the bare metal, but I really like the colors. Yeah, I like that this kind of looks like yeah. the Armenian flag. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this this is definitely... Armenian a, Airlines. This is a good, this is a good livery. Uh, the United font... In the weird, the weird United font, as opposed to the later font where it's in serif text. Oh, still had this the good is very logo. remember the future to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. in a way that I quite like. Yeah, the 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 world you were raised for no longer exists. Things of this. I mode. think every plane should have the big Pacific Southwest smile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, like my 07 Mazda. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're so happy to see you. <laughs> So we are we are setting up for United Airlines Flight 232. Uh, you, this yes. particular DC-10 United had bought in 1971. Um, it, so it, they'd had it for what uh, 18 years. Yeah, 16,997 flights, which is not unusual then or now. It's well within sort of expected lifespan. Yes, it's not even really an old plane. Like 20 years old is not that weird at all. Yeah, planes last a long time, especially now. 
Um, you know, there, there's still 727s uh, running around, mostly in like Iran, I think. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can yeah. get really weird with that if you like go to like non US manufacturers. Like, you got a fucking illusion that was made by communists. Yes. Um, and you can see daylight through the floor or whatever, but it's still flying. Yes. And this guy, he's gone from Denver Stapleton Airport, which is the old airport, the one that didn't have conspiracy theories. Yeah, they hadn't it's built now, Lucifer yet. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's now a big new urbanist housing development. Incidentally, uh, that Stapleton, who I believe was mayor of Denver, also a prominent Klansman, because uh, right. just about everybody in his generation mm. in American politics was. That sounds about right to me, yeah. Uh, it's going from <laughs> Stapleton to Philadelphia International Airport. Woo! Uh, <laughs> which is not named after a Klansman. Uh, by, by, where, by way of Chicago O'Hare, which I don't Ooh, know. Yeah, Maybe? Yeah. I don't know. Haven't checked. I don't know either, yeah. Uh, took off 2.09 p.m. Central, ti- Central Daylight Time, right? Did oh, we... it's good. You set a date. That's how we know it's yeah. good. Did, did we put the down time. the day of this flight? Probably not. Uh, no, I think we did no. not. Uh, did, 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 doing research nice. live on yeah, air like, like it's 10,000 yeah. losses. Uh, you know, uh-huh. every once in a while. Uh-huh. Every once in a while. Uh, July 19th, a... 1989. July 19th, 1989. Okay. Cruising altitude was 37,000 feet. It's probably about, you know, this is not a huge long flight you're probably in the air for like four hours total right Mm -hmm. uh it's daytime the weather is good this is supposed to be an aggressively unremarkable flight right yeah when when they try to like make you feel better about your fear of flying and you're like they do millions of flights a day these are the yeah. bulk of the millions of flights a day they're talking about. Like this, yes, is, exactly. It, it's it's flying from like a medium sized American city to a medium sized American city, expecting nothing. The sort of like the, yeah. the briefing for this one is as usual. Um, uh, I would say I would say Denver is the only medium sized city on this itinerary. Uh, Chicago and Philly are pretty big. All right, fine, whatever. Yeah, I don't yes, care. yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, shut up, uh, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> So, our flight crew, we have pilot Alfred C. Haynes. Al we have, Haynes. Al Haynes. 1,000 hours of flight time, by the way. We have co pilot William R. Records. Mm-hmm. And we uh, have flight. Ab- also, about 20,000 hours of flight time. So, we have flight engineer, a position which has since been eliminated, Shame. Dudley J. Dvorak. Um, inventor of the keyboard. The keyboard. Inventor yeah. of the keyboard. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> Fifteen thousand hours flying. No, time. it's more efficient. Let me tell you about my ortholinear. Shut the fuck up. <sighs> flight. Flight. I love you, keyboard cool, nerds. Like, God damn. Yeah, yeah, well, sit, can, sit, can, sit in the third seat that's like sideways relative to the orientation. Yeah, of the it's, aircraft, a, it's a ninety-five Ford Ranger jump seat. Yeah. Yeah. My my and, job and is to stare gauges. at gauges. <laughs> yeah. Watch the gauges. See what they're doing. You have now been replaced by like. Um, a series of synthetic voiced alarms which have been remixed into a song with Hatsune Miku. Yes. Pull up to bring pull up to low flaps. Oh, Roz, you didn't want to? Okay. The missile knows where it is. Um. <laughs> and this is like a... This, a, this, this like is on you, Alice. flight crew. Very, very normal. Oh shit! Okay, yeah, this is the slide that I there put in about metallurgy. Yeah. I look forward to people telling me in the comments about everything I get wrong. This is based off of sketchy research because I didn't bother to use my university login for like uh, metallurgy papers. So first, we must hey, ask Alice real quick. Yes. Do you have mm-hmm. a JSTOR login? I might do. I haven't checked. Get back to me uh, about could, this. Yeah, and, thank you. I don't have much like occasion to use it at the moment. Also, if anyone wants to DM me on Twitter with their JSTOR login, I'm here. <laughs> so first, yeah. we must ask, what is metal fatigue? Um, so I think uh, you get a JSTOR login if you got a Philadelphia library card. You're joking, Ooh. really? Yeah, I, think I so, love yeah. liberalism. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, so oh, uh, I'm gonna do a uh, SciHub too, running off my <laughs> running off my Unraid server. So, don't so, quote me on that. It may not be mm. true. I know some places give you a JSTOR login with a library card. Well, if you have a JSTOR login, please DM the podcast account because my DMs are closed because you freaks won't stop sending me thirst send traps. Send the entire contents of SciHub to the post office box. Yes, thank uh, you. So, yes. so the fan disk of the engine, as we mentioned, is made out of titanium because titanium is very strong. 
However, yes. titanium rarely occurs in the shape of jet engine fan disks in nature. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you have to like forge it into that shape, which means you have to melt it. And when you melt titanium, it reacts with air in a way that can contaminate it with stuff from the atmosphere, um, which you don't want to do. So to avoid that, you melt it in a vacuum. Actually, you melt it in two vacuums at this point. Um, but this is not a foolproof process. Uh, sometimes stuff just gets into the vacuum anyway. Um, like, for instance, a rogue bit of, I don't know, pick a chemical at random, nitrogen, right, gets out yes. of the atmosphere. Are we talking like a, like a white room type of deal? I mean, yeah, potentially. I mean, it, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a vacuum forge, uh, right, which is okay. a yes. weird as hell looking machine. Um, but so your your rogue particle of of, um, of nitrogen or whatever gets in the titanium, and now you have a problem because metallurgically the titanium around it is not titanium; it's a titanium alloy. Um, and there's there's different ways of categorizing titanium alloys. They're like alpha, uh, beta, or alpha and beta. Alpha is the one with like a hexagonal close packed structure. Beta is the one with like a body centered cubic packing. This one, when nitrogen yeah. gets into it, that's an alpha alloy, and it's a very hard, very brittle alpha. Uh, this and so when this happens, this is called a hard alpha defect. Um, I, all my chemistry is coming back to me, and I don't like it. <laughs> I haven't heard the word body centered cubic packing in a long time, and I didn't want to hear it ever again. B Fuck bodies you, and Alex. spaces, <laughs> cu cubic packing, and bodies and spaces. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so th this area within the billet of titanium is now uh, very brittle, right? Uh, so brittle that when you when you machine the titanium, typically what happens is that this alpha alloy just shatters uh, and it falls out. And it leaves a hole in the titanium. It might be just like inside of it, and it's impossible to notice visually. Um, the, like there are different ways to try and reduce this happening. Like uh, there's different like you can use fucking like plasma hearths and shit like that, which sounds like some fucking Skyrim to try and like uh, melt titanium. And this is like an an alive area of material science, and you can make a lot of money if you can figure out how to do this. Um, but it, it's sort of an inevitability that. You machine like uh, you you forge like X number of billets of titanium. You will get some like hard alpha defects. You'll get some other defects, um, and so you have this billet which has a hole in it, and you can't see that visually. The way you check for that is you literally you just do an ultrasound of the titanium, um, and so Alcoa makes uh, Alcoa the uh, Aluminum Corporation of America forges this titanium billet, which is a little bit like outside of their wheelhouse, I guess, and they send it to GE, or the division of GE that makes aircraft engines, and GE ultrasounds uh, it, just to make sure. Alcoa was like a first mover on a lot of weird metals, just because aluminum was kind of a weird metal for a long right. time. Mm, makes sense. So GE, GE like ultrasound this, um, and it fails the ultrasound check. It like uh, The ultrasound detects this cavity in it, which means... GE has to send this back to Alcoa to be scrapped, to be melted down, re reforged, whatever. Um, it's wrong. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the ultrasound comes back, says it's a boy, and GE is yeah. like, okay, this goes back. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> GE loses the fucking billet. They just lose track of it. It just disappears into the wrong thing. Someone like full, like fumbles it into the wrong pile, whatever. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Hey, when um, I fumbled the titanium bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it just, yeah. uh, it, it keeps it. And, and G makes it. 30-yard pass, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, but uh, G, like, this has been, like, tossed across, a, like, a, a warehouse floor or whatever, um, and is now sort of known good. It's been tested and is falsely believed to be fine and is machined into a fan disk, a fan disk that now has a minute hole in it. Um, and as we said, this fan disk is, like, going very, very fast. It's being subjected to a lot of stress. Um, and it has a weak point in it, a weak point which is now going to crack at the edges. Um, and as the cycle of stress goes, you know, like up and down, take off landing, all this, that's repeated thousands and thousands of times, over which those cracks get wider and deeper. Um, but this is also a known problem. Like, GE accepts that it's going to miss some anyway. So part of the scheduled maintenance of this is... A guy, like a maintenance technician, has to like spray fluorescent dye onto the fan disc, and that's going to like penetrate into cracks. Um, and later, 
they will find that die present in this fan disc, which means that it got into that crack, someone was looking for it, and just no one noticed or cared enough to write it up. Because replacing a fan disc is a pain in the ass. It's expensive. Um, and also it's quite difficult to see. So, this crack is busy cracking away worse and worse every time, with no one any the wiser. There is no other way to detect this. Um, until, and I get to do it this time, 3.16pm on July the 19th, 1989, when... Wham! Whammo! The boom! Bang. Yes! Various sort of like Batman animated series noises. This yeah. is the actual fan disc. This is the, the actual one as they later pulled it out of a cornfield and reconstructed it. And as you may notice, it's not supposed to look like that. It's got a big crack in the middle of it. You can tell it's a good image because of all the photocopier burn. <laughs> yeah, this is from the NTSB report, which is remarkably detailed, even by their mm -hmm. standards. Um, and has a lot of like very heavily uh, photocopied illustrations, a number of which are in here. Um, but yeah, so the, this just explodes. And what happens to the aircraft, I've kind of characterized with a painting. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is the yeah. DC-10 devouring his own son. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you divide engine failures into like contained and uncontained engine failures. A contained engine failure is when stuff breaks and it stays within the sort of like the tube, the casing. Um, uh, what this suffers is uh, an uncontrolled, an uncontained engine failure. Um, Yes, which is uh, not ideal. Yeah the, yeah, the the way that you would characterize this is that the engine explodes. This yeah. is uh, this is the tail mounted engine, by the way. This is bad. This is this is engine number two, which is the tail mounted one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Justin. Uh, so this is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Uh, people are annoyed by these, so let me get to the point. We have this thing called Patreon, right? The deal is you give us two bucks a month, and we give you an extra episode once a month. Uh, sometimes it's a little inconsistent, but, you know, it's two bucks. You get what you pay for. Um, it also gets you our full back catalog of bonus episodes, so you can learn about exciting topics like guns pickup trucks, or pickup trucks with guns on them. The money we raise through Patreon goes to making sure that the only ad you hear on this podcast is this one. Anyway, that's something to consider if you have two bucks to spare each month. Uh, join at patreon.com forward slash WTYP pod. Do it if you want. Or don't. It's your decision and we respect that. Back to the show. So, this tail-mounted engine fan disc it disintegrates, and of course that means it throws all those fan blades all over the place. They're made of titanium. The plane's made of aluminum. The titanium wins. Um, so, on the way out, some of these fan blades, they went into the tail. Now, the tail has a control surface on it, which is actuated by three independent hydraulic systems. Yeah, which rudder. are all very close together at one point. Yeah. And so it, one, some debris just severs all three of them. All three systems. And they bleed out in, instantly. Um, yeah, and you just and have the, no hydraulic pressure left. Yeah, you have, uh, you have a big issue because there are three hydraulic systems. There's no fourth one. Um, <laughs> and these move all the control surfaces in the airplane, right? The flaps, the ailerons, the elevators, the rudder. That's what this one is called, the rudder, right? Um, I'm good at planes. I'm, no, I'm <laughs> being, not. <laughs> be, being one of those sort of like Boeing guys who objects to like computerized control by being like, it's die by wire. You should have direct control over a control surface, but I'm doing that one step further for hydraulics. And I'm like, you should be able to like mechanically crank every control surface on the aircraft. I mean, um, I, I want to like say a there was... Like a radio, yes. 
Yeah. They, they, uh, there, there, there was some like statistical analysis before this occurred that was like the chances of all three hydraulic systems going offline was one in a billion. Um, you know, yeah, unless they, they this do, happens, like, apparently. Yeah. Like, Apparently they also like armored some of the hydraulic systems in places where they thought this was most likely to happen, and either that didn't work or like it was it like did, did not happen to be here. Yeah, yeah. So this is all the stuff that you use to turn the plane, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> Any sort of like attitude control. Um... So the flight cr crew hears here's this explosion, right? Quickly determine this is a problem with the number two engine. Go through the procedure to shut down engine number two. Well, they're shutting it down. Co-pilot records noticed that the plane was not responding to any control input. And a flight engineer noticed all the hydraulic pressure gauges are at zero. It's and the plane that. was slowly rolling to the right. Yes, it's, it's beginning. Don't want that. Well, it will continue for a while, which is called a fugoid oscillation, uh, which is sort of the yes. specific characteristic motion of a, a plane with like no positive attitude control, where it just kind of like, Woo. yeah, it sort of goes. Blah, 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 blah. I'm making a hand <laughs> gesture here that none of you can see. Oh, yeah. the nice yes. Yeah, it, it, yeah it climbs, I'll do it this descends. with my hands. It climbs, it descends. Uh, <laughs> yes. yeah. It, yeah. it goes, it goes up and down, uh, and. One of the problems with this is that it's it's a feedback loop. It's a, like a, a positive thing because the the more it goes up, the more it goes down. The more it goes up, the more it goes down. And it, yes. you know. It... So, in a sort of situation where you lose power like this, there's a backup, right? Which is um, the air driven generator. You can I deploy love this, this, this thing. little thing off the side of the plane. It's a little propeller that pops out the side of the plane, and it powers the central electrical systems and hydraulics. Right, so even if you lose every engine, you can still control the plane with no mm -hmm. power other than stuff that from the plane's own momentum and the will um, and the will of God. Don't forget the will of God. Yes. Now, <laughs> the problem here is they deployed it, but there was no hydraulic fluid. Yes. Right. So it, it, it solves it, the problem didn't do you don't shit have. Yet. Um, yes, it solved a different it, problem. Right. Yeah, because the, the, the problem is you don't have any power. You have plenty of power. Like, you have two engines that are working. You have two perfectly. engines, yeah. Um, like, you, you're getting electrical power f through everything. It's just that all of the uh, hydraulic systems have no hydraulic fluid left in them. Yes. It's like an empty tube. So there's, there's essentially no control on the plane save for modulating the thrust on the engines. Yeah, and th Great. this is the crazy part. This sort of works. Like, yes. uh, they're right. sort of able to control the aircraft using, like, variable thrust, right? You, you want to go left, you, like, power up the right engine, power down the left engine a bit, stuff like this. Um, and, and so we go off on this sort of magical mystery tour yes. while these three guys try to work out how to fly a plane like wrong on purpose for the first time yes yeah <laughs> i i can't stress enough by the way this is not something you could possibly ever train anyone to do no there, yeah, there would be not, no not reason to, to. You're not supposed to be able to recover from the situation. Yes, no, you're supposed yeah, to go it, into a, into a ditch, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sort of an outside scope thing where you're like your your sort of instructions here in the big binder are like brace for impact. Yeah, I, right. you're, 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 call you're, your mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about to say, make peace with your gods. <laughs> 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 so, all right. So they they start out down here. This is this is Mapleton, Iowa. Or Iowa. I understand some people call it Iowa now, or they have oh. for a long time. Um, I, I, like I, Correctionville I, up here on the board. Yes, I, 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 I heard this in the music, man. Um, anyway, you know they're going, they're going, they're going north. I'm not sure why they take this flight path. Uh, engine flare happens up here north of Alta. They're gonna head. Out, they're supposed to go this way towards Chicago. Um. We have this engine failure, and now they can only turn right, which they do. Um, 
air traffic control hears about the emergency. They're like, all right, can you make it to Minneapolis? We can send you to Minneapolis. Well, the problem is they could only turn right and they had to turn left to go to <laughs> Minneapolis. <laughs> just so like that's... hold it. Just just like hold it and go 360 degrees, you know? Yeah, that, so that, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a big loop, you know? They don't think they can make it to Minneapolis. They're going All to right. Sioux you City, guys, Iowa. You guys ever see uh, King of Cobb, right? All right. So what <laughs> we're going to do. <laughs> uh, now, so pilot, the co-pilot, flight crew is in close contact with the uh, flight attendants. And the flight attendants say, hey, there's a guy. There's a guy in the, uh, in the plane. He's the United Airlines DC-10 training check airman. Uh, his name is Dennis Fitch, right? Uh, training Leslie check airman. Leslie Nielsen is here. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. We're all counting on you. <laughs> um, so, so Dennis Fitch is, um, you know, the training check airman is like, uh, he's, he's qualified to train people. He's also qualified to, um, I guess the check airman is like you, you, um, you are able to check that pilots are qualified. You're the one who actually qualifies the pilot and ensures they know what they're doing. Right, yeah, so this guy knows check rides where where you yeah. do that. We have to like prove that you know how to do the thing. Yeah, this this uh, is the guy who knows the most about the DC ten that you can know, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of like plane driving instructor. Yes, plane so, team. Yes, so so Haynes, <laughs> Captain Haynes, invited him to cockpit where this real humdinger of a situation was developing, right? <laughs> Is that from the black box? Real humdinger of a situation? <laughs> real, real humdinger right here. <laughs> Basically, like, this, we, is we a, this, the... is a, this is a conundrum. We have Sit the rep, cockpit things voice are bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it basically is, like, uh, <laughs> at, at one point, Fitch, the, like, the uh, check airman, says to Haynes, I, I tell you what, we'll have a beer when this is done, and Haynes is like, well, I don't drink, but I'm going to start. Which is like, <laughs> I, uh, also, I believe this is the flight that says, uh, you're clear to land on any runway. Yes, and he says, yeah, you want to be specific in making a runway, huh? <laughs> yes. So, you know, Fish comes on the flight deck. He knows there's no procedure for this kind of problem. The best he can surmise is that well, maybe we My can put dude the land. takes off his pants yeah. so that he yeah. can just shit on the floor, knowing it will not matter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing they do is they put the landing gear down, which might hold the nose of the plane steadier. But right. essentially, Fitch was assigned to be the man to manipulate the thrust on the one and three engines, while the rest of the flight crew was trying everything else to mm -hmm. uh, control the aircraft, right? Um, they got United Airlines maintenance on the uh, radio, who were sort of flabbergasted that all three hydraulic systems could be offline at once. They also sort of kept pestering the crew with like, well, have you looked at page 91 on the manual? Yeah, motherfucker, like, <laughs> I read the whole thing. <laughs> there's, a, there's a quote from Haynes here I like, which is, uh, he says, we were too busy to be scared. You yes, must maintain yeah. your composure in the airplane or you will die. You yes. learn that from your first day flying, which really puts a, puts a spin on the fucking Chuck Yeager thing pilots do, you know? Yes. Well, I, <laughs> I always liked the... Uh, the the out the thing I've said that like I like I personally am very competent, but only moments of extreme crisis. That's mm, the one yeah. time I'm not anxious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's there's um if you read the transcripts from the uh, flight deck, uh, very remarkable things happens while this is all going on. This crew is very calm. They're very collected. Everyone's working very well together. Um, everyone knows that they're in a very dire situation, but you know, they're even joking with each other throughout this is all going on. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Gallus humor has an important place in our culture. This is true. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, nominally Haynes is in charge. He's taking input from everyone. You know, uh, people are tasks are being effectively delegated, like going back to check if the control surfaces are working. Uh, you know, there's good communication with the flight attendants. There's like, uh, you know, even as this plane is wildly out of control, the flight deck is this well-oiled machine. Mm. Yeah, if you're gonna have a plane totally lose control, I mean, this is this I is the, the crew optimal, you want. This is the yes. optimal yes. crew for the yeah. job. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, part of this is because United Airlines was one, an early adopter of something called crew resource management. Way back in 1981, they were the first airline to do so, which is a sort of philosophy on the flight deck where. Instead of the, the the captain's word being law, there was a more collaborative process of piloting the aircraft 
where, you know, uh, everyone had valid input. This minimizes the risk of human error, which, you know, could cause one mistake, one boneheaded decision from one person crashing the plane to, yeah, uh, you know, now everyone's, yeah, everyone's got, stuff. yeah, everyone's got input. Every, everyone can say, that seems wrong. Let's not do that. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this is this is a remarkably like well functioning flight deck for this crisis. And so we um, see the sort of like uh, long flight path of them trying to figure this out with yes. a lot of like right hand loops in it. Yes, this is this is um, they turn right. Uh, they turn right. <laughs> How do you go uh, to Zoo City where you take 16 right turns? They somehow managed to do one left. <laughs> yeah. hey, over correcting, you know. Nice yeah, little change yeah. of pace there. <laughs> and then um and then there was this 360 degree loop here. Um and they're on approach to Sioux Gateway Airport, which was by far the nearest airport that could possibly take a DC10. Um while they're on the way, ATC is informing them, all right, um you know, drive for the airport, drive for runway 33. Uh, if not, there's an interstate you could maybe try and land on. <laughs> yeah, like, no, it's, it's we're, kind we're of going like, for the runway. Th- this is where you get the sort of like the funny but serious thing is like you want to be particular and make it a runway. But on the other hand, what all of this is in aid of is in large part uh, the thing is going to crash. Maybe everybody is going to die. What you want to do is fatality not... reduction is what we're going yeah, for. What, yeah. what you want to do is not <laughs> dump it on top of somebody's house, right? right. On top of right. like lots of people's houses. Um, do the words harm and... reduction mean anything to you? Yeah, yeah. Like yes. at the airport, it, you're not really making some like a landing at this point to crash whatever you do. The idea is it's a controlled environment with a lot of like yes. uh, emergency services nearby and not much else that you can sort of crash into. Uh, and incidentally, they do happen to have a lot of emergency services nearby, um, because the uh, Iowa Air National Guard is like weirdly, unexpectedly on duty at Sioux Gateway Airport. So they have like like two, three hundred trained personnel who are like, like there, ready with stretchers and stuff. They they do not have enough firefighting equipment though, because. So City Airport was not certified for aircraft as large as the DC-10, so mm. they don't necessarily have all the firefighting equipment they should have for an accident of this magnitude. Yeah, about um, this firefighting equipment, because as they're sort of going in circles dumping fuel, uh, the yeah. airport like scrambles its fire department, and they want to stage all of their appliances and stuff somewhere close so they can be you know, on, on the scene quickly. So, yes, which was they stored it all, they staged it all on closed runway twenty two. Well, it's closed, right? I mean, it's perfect. Yes, and there's there's several more problems they're discovering as they're flying. Number one being, guess what else is hydraulically operated? Ooh, the, uh, the landing ooh. gear, but they've already lowered the, that. So no, the landing gear you can drop in emergency, okay. but the brakes are hydraulic. Oh fuck! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's going to be that's going to be a problem. Um, Sioux City uh, Airport. They staged all of their fire trucks on runway twenty two. Um, they're flying generally in the direction of the airport. Uh, Sioux City approach says, or ATC says, United two thirty two heavy winds currently three six zero at one one three sixty to eleven. You're cleared to land on any runway. And Haynes says, Roger, you want to make it particular and make it a runway, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, but Haynes, he can't really turn to make it onto runway 31. But he does notice that dead ahead of him is runway 22. So he says, I'm going to runway 22. about 20- to make yep. this shit a million times <laughs> worse. Much, much worse, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, okay, I can only do runway 22. So then I got to get all the fire equipment off the runway as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, <see ya. laughs> yeah, yeah. How fast can you start a fire truck and floor it? We're gonna you know? find out. I, I, <laughs> I have a feeling there were people in the cabs of the trucks. Low and torque, low and torque, low and torque. <laughs> I have a feeling these trucks are running. <laughs> so, despite all odds, and, and one thing, if you look at this flight path here, how remarkably straight they were able to ha- have it, heading straight to the airport here. Um, 
they were lined up for runway 22. Um, they were going way too fast. Um, they actually they had, got quite good at flying yeah, it to just yeah, off of yeah, like an hour's practice, which is really yeah, they funny. Should've, should've, maybe they should have stayed in the air a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they're they're lined up with the runway. They're going too fast. They're sinking too fast. Um, they have no brakes. Yeah. Planes but it get looks, harder to control the slower you're going, though. Yeah, it looks a lot better than it should. Hmm. Right? Uh, Fitch is still manipulating the engines. But at the very last possible second before they made contact with the runway, uh, the plane dipped to the right, and that's when all hell broke loose. Yeah, kind of comes in yeah. on its side. Um, yes. Like, it lands wing first and then gets sort of, like... Thrown. It sort of, you know, yeah, it starts to skid, starts to roll over. Some witnesses say it started to tumble, it broke into pieces. This, the right wing impacted the runway. The plane was going about 250 miles an hour. Maximum landing speed is 160 miles an hour on this plane. Uh, it goes right off the runway. Um, it broke into a bunch of pieces. Some of the large pieces, like parts of the wings, left the airport grounds entirely. And caught fire. Just um, do your own thing, you know, burn down someone's cornfield. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the whole the whole plane was, you know, wrecked, destroyed, um, and uh, you know, it was uh, it was very bad. It was not a good situation to, to be like, in. Gouge out of the earth it's taken here as it sort of yes. like veered rightwards. And um, this is this is where you know you have the fire equipment on scene, like right there, and they go over and they start trying to extinguish the fire, but again, they don't have. They don't have the sheer amount of uh, fire retardant to, uh, or the capability to put it on the plane fast enough to avoid a major fire developing pretty much instantaneously. Yeah, that's why you need those cool sort of giant airport fire tenders, is because you need to be able to like dump yeah, a ones, shitload of the, foam. Yeah, the ones that are like they they carry like a million tons of flame retardant, and they go mm -hmm. zero to sixty in yeah. half a second. Yeah. 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 What if we did that, firefighting by top by yeah. top dragster? Yes, they have, they have yeah, twenty yeah, yeah. wheels. That's um, such a like a fucking know. like Lego playset ass yeah. vehicle. I yeah. really <laughs> like. They're always like fluorescent yellow as well. Oh um, uh, yeah. yeah, they're great. Um, but so we have another NTSB diagram here of yes. what happens to the cabin. Um, I've titled this slide: Are you going to survive the crash landing or? Why Alice gets decision anxiety from the part of the airline ticket buying process where they let you pick out your seat. Um, because yeah, that's they show well, you, you should, then you should fly Southwest, Alice, because you'll never be you'll never be aware enough to pick your own seat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. no, instead, like even budget airlines here, they just uh, they give you a little diagram, much like this, unhelpfully, to be like, hey, where, where are you sitting? I'm like, oh, what's uh, t time to review a bunch of these diagrams and figure out where my odds are best. Um, so. Well, Jesus Christ, lady. I'm normal, mentally. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, Captain Haynes and Fitch and Records and, uh, what's the flight engineer's name? Uh, Dvorak. The inventor of the Dvorak, Dvorak right. Uh, uh, have now exhausted the airplane's uh, supply of liquor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, against, I mean, okay, so, they say, among pilots, a good landing is one you can walk away from, and a great landing is one where you can use the plane again. <laughs> the flight crew has, against all odds, done a good landing. <laughs> uh, yeah. They all survived. I believe Fitch got uh, some pretty severe injuries, though. Um, you know, without any flight controls save for engine thrust, they put this plane on the ground without killing themselves, and mm -hmm with the remarkable survival rate among the passengers, right? So this plane breaks into several parts. Um, so like you can see here, these wavy lines are where it broke apart. Um, the cockpit just so, departs. Um, the yeah. cockpit departs the plane. Just, I'd, ha I'd um, head out, right. Yes. yes. Um, Injection cockpit, you know? First class does pretty badly. Um, you know, <laughs> the most rich. of them are, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but whatever. Um, <laughs> sort of between <laughs> it's like well at least you got crushed to death in a comfortable seat you know i was about to say yeah um sort of the the middle section of the plane 
between like the wing exit rows and the first uh the first uh exit up here these folks do pretty well uh I, most of them I, live I, i'm struck by the remarkable presence of uh, no injuries. Like there's well, right. like, like a do a yeah. dozen people there who just walked off the plane and were fine, and were just like, yes. "Don't see what the big problem is." Uh, Behind I, why that... the fuck am I not in Philadelphia? But apart from that, you know. Oh, good cord. <laughs> Behind that row, you had issues because, of course, the wings caught fire. Uh, lots of people died of smoke inhalation back here, um, all the way to the back of the plane, where some of the people near the exit they got out pretty easily. Um, but you have lots of serious injuries. You have lots of people die, but over half the plane survives. And this, this is, is like, crazy. Oh, that's a literal, a literal miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Also, one thing you may notice is a uh, number of like inlet occupants. Uh, th this is one of the fucked things about this is that United had been doing a program to like encourage more kids to fly. It was like World Children's Day or something. So they're yes. like, "Fuck it, let's just herd a bunch of kids onto a plane." And I was this plane. So, uh, hey, yeah. hey, 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 kids, you want to go from Denver to Philadelphia? <laughs> See the Liberty and, Bell? Yeah. You want to go to Philadelphia in 1989? <laughs> <laughs> uh, have an experience whether the plane gets there safely or not. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. So I believe of the 296 passengers and crew, um, 111 were killed in the crash. One died 31 days after the crash. Uh, the rest of the folks survived with various degrees of injury. I mean, you you did use, you you did get injured on this plane, right? Um, you know, Unless a lot, you're a lot one of, of like 12 people. Yes. Um, now the flight crew was in the separated, uh, you know, the cabin, just lying there among the wreckage. They were all stuck in there for 35 minutes until the rescuers identified oh that's the cabin right there we should go we should go yeah, check not, that out that's not like recognizably a cockpit anymore if you've yes. seen sort of like bits of the fuselage after like any plane yeah. crash even like sort of a crash landing it stops looking like a plane pretty quickly and starts looking right, yes. like you've just like thrown a bunch of sheet metal into a blender um but again they all survived with varying degrees of injuries uh, Fitch got the most severe injuries out of this, but they all recovered and they went back to flying airplanes after this Jesus incident. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Haynes, like, did some, like, public speaking, uh, on, 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 like, aviation safety after this, which you would, yes. I think. I, um, uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> but v very much of the sort of, like, I'm not a hero, the real heroes are, uh, the flight attendants. Sort yes. of mold, which, yeah, also true. Um, because keeping the entire cabin like as relatively calm and safe as possible, and then getting everybody to like brace, even knowing that like you know half of them are gonna die in the process, just, it's not easy. And then it doing the evacuation, like flight attendants are fucking incredible, genuinely. Um, mm -hmm. and it's not. One of the flight attendants was killed in this incident, and I don't know who it was. Um, hmm. I actually can't see either. Um, yeah, but they they had eight flight attendants on board, and uh, you know, you, your reward for doing all of this shit is, uh, I guess, United runs like a sexist ad campaign about you. Yes, they they assign you to the like, all men flight. Yeah, <laughs> you, you you're pulling fucking like uh, burning people out of the aircraft, uh, and you know they put you on a billboard that's like you want to fuck this woman, you want to fly to uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to you you fly to Philadelphia and fuck this woman. <laughs> it's like thanks, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. Appreciate that. <laughs> um. But through this, of course, we, we learned valuable things about crew resource management, right? Oh, I love this. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, by all rights, this should have been a plane that went down with all hands. You know, no one should have survived this, right? right. right. Yeah, we cannot emphasize enough how miraculous yeah. it was that anyone survived. It's one of those, like, statistics that genuinely baffles me is that, like, most people who are in plane crashes survive. 
And right. That's, like, that's something that we've sort of clawed our way up to through shit like this. And that's yeah. genuinely insane to me because previously that was like a an absolutely like a zero sum game. Like right. you either get to your destination safely or you are paced. And now it's more like even if the plane crashes, you probably statistically going to be okay, which is uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of a lot of plane crashes or stuff like, well, we overran the runway and we yeah. fell in a ditch, you know. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah, fuck it, I'm milking that shit for life. I'm I'm yeah. around in my like plane crash survivor t-shirt. Yes. I'm doing interviews. I'm I'm doing public speaking on like resilience and courage and what it taught me about loving myself. I'm milking that shit for the rest of my life. No one is ever winning an argument with me ever again if my plane goes into a ditch because like you you argue had, with me about it. Had to anything. write off the airframe because <laughs> yeah. it was cheaper than repairing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you want me to do literally anything? I'm like, "Oh, you know, I can't because of the injuries I sustained when I was in a plane crash." Which I survived. Yes, <laughs> I, I was in. I was in a old seven sixty seven that overran a runway, fell in a ditch. <laughs> they could have repaired it, but it was uh, the frame. The, the 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 fuselage was now like uh, two tenths of an inch out of line, and they just decided to write it off. Anyway, I've been traumatized by that ever since. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, everyone survived, but I saw one of the overhead bins. Open and some they luggage fell out. On the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see this boo boo? <laughs> yeah, That's this, a hero's boo boo. Absolutely, <laughs> totally unironically. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I'm having that shit and put on my tombstone. Plane crash survivor. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of mitigating factors here. There's really good weather. It was during the day. The airport was nearby. There's very rapid response by emergency services. There was a shift get, shift change in the nearby trauma center, so there were a lot more people on duty. Um, there was uh, the the Air uh, National Guard. Air National Guard was there, but really got this plane on the ground without killing everyone was crew resource management, right? Because no one person could land this plane, but several people could almost do it. Um, and a fun yeah, thing I about I remember seeing that they, they, they like tried to to like work this out after the fact at United and tried to work out how that how you could possibly do this. And essentially, their conclusion was, I don't know, you can't. Thanks, boys. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Should we um, put something in the binder about how to do this if this happened? They're like, no, you, you can't. You can't no, do no, this. You, shit you can't again. do it. They're, yeah, they they ran it in flight simulators afterwards, and no pilots could get a survivable landing. Right. Wow. This is that this is um, you know, I I, I I truly Allah smiled on this flight crew that day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and there have been a small number of similar incidents since UA two thirty two since. Only one of them, which was a DHL flight out of Baghdad that was hit by a missile in 2003, resulted in a safe landing with no control surface. Jesus. Imagine doing like this level of flying and, you know, on the one hand, if you're doing it for United, it's like, oh, I'm going to save all these kids. You're doing it on a DHL flight out of Baghdad I'm gonna in 2003. I'm going to save all the like, sex butts. Yeah, I'm going to save all of, this, all of these porn mags that are being sent to, like, Marines or whatever. Yeah, um, gonna, I am gonna, a national hero. <laughs> there's, there's, like, a bunch of, like, stolen Mesopotamian or Babylonian <laughs> artifacts in the back that are going to a hobby lobby, and I'm, like, <laughs> white-knuckling the control column, <laughs> like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you. And and you know one of the things about this is of, uh, since then we've gone down from these three man flight crews to two man flight crews and the airlines have started agitating for one man on short flights so Fuck who knows that. if you absolutely could, yeah. if anything it should be higher I want a twenty man flight crew because apart from anything else uh, absolutely bolsters your resilience in case the other nineteen guys have heart attacks simultaneously and also. Say, yeah. If one of them goes fucking Andreas Lubitz and decides that he's gonna like neat yeet himself into a mountainside with everybody else, then right. I would rather have nineteen dudes beat the shit out of him than one. So, yeah, as about to say, you got you got you got twenty guys uh, on the flight deck uh, 
you know, uh, three of them fly the plane. The other 17 uh, do some kind of hold guns to the back of their heads to yeah, make sure they yeah, keep absolutely. flying the plane. We, it, it's, I was it's thinking of some kind of pirates. Of, proof. I was thinking of some kind of pirates of Penzance thing, but updated uh. for airplanes. <laughs> oh, of course. This is this is the future of air travel, right? It's universal yeah. basic income because, uh, you know, we're flying the civilianized C5 Galaxy. The flight crew of 20, everybody's driving the cars on there. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like again you have sort of like slapstick unionism where every one of those 20 guys is in a different union yes um i'm in the second flight engineers union i'm in the third <laughs> flight engineers union. <laughs> international brotherhood of 15th flight engineers yeah an oiler you got a fireman for some reason <laughs> stoker <laughs> Shul, White, Shul, 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 yeah, Shul, man. brakeman yeah grind never stops <laughs> ross <Yeah. laughs> So yeah, I, I, would this be achievable ever again? Who knows? I mean, I, I at this point where modern plane design has stuff like they have hydraulic fuses in there now, so you could not have a complete hydraulic failure from one location, or at least it'd be very, very difficult. Um, this has the bizarre effect of rehabilitating the image of the DC-10 as a much more survivable and safe plane than it was. Um, makes you know they had seem more glamorous too yes um and they changed how they forged titanium to reduce the chance of cracks they use something i want to say is called the um the triple vacuum system now which i don't mm. know what it is that's a whole extra vacuum although i think there's also like a like a cold hearth thing or whatever that is where they fuck around with temperature as i said there's a lot of interesting weird metallurgy going into this um yes so but, yeah, uh, the, the the titanium that you build this stuff out of is safer than it's ever been. Yeah, uh, air travel is very very safe, just very very unpleasant. Yeah, yeah. But if it's if it's safe, then why does the room that I'm in go fast and then tilt upwards? It's not. It's not that. That's not normal. As I said, it's safe. It's just unpleasant. It is unpleasant. <laughs> Well, well. I mean, it, it's tempting to say that this is like it's it's some combination of like extremely good crew resource management and also dumb luck slash divine favor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, without the second one of those, you could have extremely good crew resource management as the thing crashes into a cornfield. Like, yes, I do think there there are there are lessons here uh, about uh, listening to people, though. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, that's that's always. I guess that's the big one you get out of this one is, uh, uh, you know, if you're in charge of something, uh, you, you're going to do better if you listen to other people. Uh, I know that's Some... the most generic lesson imaginable, but. <laughs> sort of like, you know, uh, golden rule stuff. But on the yeah, other hand, yeah. it works for us. You know, we, yes. we practice podcast resource management. And uh, oh, this is true. Instead of like the early days of the podcast when uh, when you were the sort of like tyrannical captain who like did everything, <laughs> um, oh, I st I still like to think of myself as that though. That's true. <laughs> yeah, we have a slightly more dictator sort of... for life. Yeah, yes. yeah, for sure. <laughs> more equitable division of labor, I suppose. Yes. Um, and fucking I credit where it's due to. Uh, pilots for really legitimately earning the Chuck Yeager shit. Yeah. Yes. I will not make fun of your aviators, even though you are visibly a fifty-year-old man. Um... <laughs> <laughs> if you fly a plane, you can wear aviators. I guess that's, that's what they're called. You're an aviator, Alice. Yeah. Yeah. I, guess, I guess so. I guess so. All right. <laughs> but what's Joe Biden's excuse? I don't shut think, up. Yeah, I don't think Joe Biden can fly <laughs> Listen, a plane. Listen, Jack. <laughs> Maybe Listen, he can fly a plane. I don't know. Yeah, the, the, the answer is to call me fat and challenge me to do push ups, which honestly, I'm pretty sure fair enough. Go off. You can also wear aviators if you're the president. Okay, so uh, you got president, airline pilots, uh, uh, my dad, Douglas MacArthur, your dad. Your dad. God, well, God. my dad wears regular aviators, not sunglasses aviators. Yeah, your oh, dad. Those are like, you're... That's not an aviator anymore. Those are dad glasses. Yeah, well, I guess dad, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, he's just a dad. What's up, Dan? How's it going? 
Yeah, my dad wears those too. I wouldn't call them aviators. My dad also yeah. wears those. <laughs> it's just it, it's a it's a timeless classic fit for 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 the dads of you know in in need of uh, actually Corinne also lunches. wears those now at this point. They're kind of cool. I think kind of maybe no. They're don't tell back. her that. No, they are. They are. Don't Gen don't do that. <laughs> I'm sorry to encourage her, but I genuinely think they look good. Look at aviators, but they're transitions lenses. Oh wow! <laughs> I should not speak that into existence. <laughs> um, all right, just offensive to use to use the name of my community for those lenses, which look like absolute dog shit. Um, well, I think I think we've already mentioned all the things we learned. Yeah, unless anyone else has anything else. I don't think so. All right, I don't. Crew yeah. resource management. Do that. Crew resource management. Do do crew resource resource. It's like socialism in small groups. Um, some anarchists <laughs> would do well to learn some crew resource management. Eat shit, bud. <laughs> <laughs> I um. It's a horizontal command structure, but it's still a command structure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what if we go all the passengers together and they voted to elect a flight crew? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> the flight crew served 10 minute terms before being replaced in another all plane election. Uh, the flight the, the the flight crew has this uh, to step down before the new one is elected. <laughs> I gotta turn I gotta turn auto back on. <laughs> All right. Masses of in masses of boots defer to the bootmaker. In masses of flying the plane defer to the guy in the aviators with the silly accent. Yes. Yes. Well, we have a segment on this podcast called Safety Third. Shake hands for danger. Hello, Justin, Liam, Alice, and potential guest. Go fuck yourself. Wrong. Oh. Well, in fairness, the first time we put this one up, there was a guest. Too bad. The Shut episode up. was too long. <laughs> <laughs> I work part time for a museum that deals with the history of the urban transport of my city. Oh, One boy. of the things we do is guided tours of disused parts of the network, notably closed stations. Uh, more locks, more locks. You're going to find more locks in there and chuds and like sewer alligators and shit. Yes. On some of our sites, the station may be closed, but the railway is not, and trains can pass in and out of the site. But notably, at one of our sites, Station A. There is no second route out of the station, which means evacuating in a fire requires that we would have to walk down the railway line in the tunnel. Fire safety plan. Do not have a fire. Yes. This means that we, as tour guides, have to contact the power controller and make sure the power is turned off and lay the appropriate short circuit device to ensure it cannot be turned on. That's these guys. They make contact with the rail and the third rail, thus causing a short circuit. Oh, these guys uh, seem cool. Yes, because because in a in a third rail system, the rail carries the positive current, and then the um the or the third rail carries the positive current, and then the running rails carry the return current. Um, but I want to say I don't quite know how this works, but like this is this plus this, this is sort of like arrangement of pipes that c takes on yeah. the role of Robert Shaw at the end of the taking yeah. of Pelham mm -hmm. 1, 2, 3. But th this guy is going to be like plus 600 volts, and this one is zero volts. So that's your difference in voltage there. Um, I think that's how that works. I'm not sure. Um, so oh, the Third rail scare the fuck out of me. Yeah. So this means we as tour guys have to contact blah, blah, blah. This is all fine because the site is at the end of a branch line and it's not used by trains, but which might have the power applied to the third rails. Sure. Now, recently, there's been a change in the practice on site due to engineering works further up the branch at the junction, which is station B, where it meets the main line of this metro route. As a result, we are meant to now contact the engineering supervisor at station B to confirm that they have turned the power off and laid the short circuit device themselves. We then don't touch the track at station A at all. This is, of course, way better for me, as I don't want to go back on the track if I don't have to. Apart from anything else, railway track is, like, really gross. Like, yes. Uh, if you've ever spent any time on or around it, it's, it's filthy. It's covered in, oh, like, uh, 
rats and roaches rats, and garbage uh, like weird metal dust from rails and wheels yeah. um like it's weird yeah it's Plus wet the warlocks, obviously it's creepy it's and wet, wet. yeah yes. yeah it's creepy yeah. and wet Ugh. yeah However, the communication about this was nothing more than a very confusing email that contained several errors which were sent to us. This was only sent to our work emails, and as we are only casual zero-hours employees, most people do not read work emails, and no manager checked that we actually read and understood the changes. Uh -huh. Bearing in mind that while there are normally no trains on this branch during the engineering work, the work supervisor is permitted to allow engineering trains to run on the line. It's it's no trains apart from when there are, which is yes, you know, no no like, trains apart from when there are trains. <laughs> well, I mean, if you didn't want there to be trains, why would you leave this perfectly good rail here? That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, Any time is train time. Mm -hmm. As a result of this shoddy communication system, a member of staff who had not read the new briefing began assessing soot. <laughs> I don't think you're in any position to to complain about uh, confusing know, emails that contain several errors. Uh, I, I assume I assume uh, accessing sites in question, not knowing about the changes to the to the procedures. Uh huh. This person then began accessing the track without actually speaking to the person who was in charge of the power and train movements. Oh no. Meanwhile, the engineering supervisor had no idea if anyone was on site at station A began ringing off-duty staff to see if they knew what was going on, as they were the only people they had number for. Or numbers, excuse me. The staff member on site is lucky that someone who isn't actually trained in the procedure was there, who had heard about the change and told them to stop. When this was raised yeah, to... Yeah, because, like, <laughs> otherwise, you just go onto the thing and get hit by an engineering train. Yes. <laughs> or even if you don't, get fucking zapped by the third rail. Or both. Mm, at the same I'm, time. I'm increasingly suspecting this system may even have a fourth rail. Um, <laughs> I mean, that just seems excessive. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, uh, there's a place that does it. Um... <laughs> The staff member on site is lucky that blah, blah, blah. When this was raised to management, the person raising it was told, ah, it's not a big deal, just a small misunderstanding, which is true, but these small misunderstandings are how people get killed. Yeah, this is a whole boring, like, two-thirds of the way through the slice of Swiss cheese, you know? Yeah, exactly. Swiss this is cheese. like, this is like, if you, yeah, if just a couple things had gone wrong there, some guy would have been turned into, a, you know, this sort of a no, no. pancake. Pancake or, or marinara, yeah. Sort of like a seared, you know, perfectly yeah. seared side of beef, depending on. Delicious. That's yeah. not that's not beef. That's long pig. <laughs> a perfectly electrically seared. See, and you say you can't use an electric stove for anything good, but it really, like seals in the juices, you know. And there's some uh, some device back in the uh, '60s that was marketed as an instant hot dog maker that just ran like. Like eight hundred yeah, volts DC this, yeah. through a hot dog. It was just gonna like <laughs> arc flash your hot dog and yeah. leave like a sort of like char around the outside. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I mean, electricity is fucking scary. Um, but you should like let leave the electrons alone as much as you can. Um, yes, because once you start squeezing them into a small tube, they get very angry. Um, and you know, if you if you turn them loose unexpectedly, then. Um, get get very angry with you in a, in a way that yeah. I don't I don't care for at all. Especially um, especially DC DC likes to spread out, you know, and it it can mm. it, yeah. How, what's the official well? There's your problem position on like the war of the currents. By the way, I feel like we should address uh, I, this. I now. would definitely have to go with AC. AC mm. is better in almost all circumstances. Uh, I would say most metro systems would be better off with overhead wire. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess third rail works because of clearances, but there's a lot of there's a lot of advantages to overhead wire out there. Um, you know, I don't I don't understand why third rail is still as popular as it is, just because it seems like a more expensive system. Um, <laughs> Legacy, I suppose. I mean, yeah. the, the so many substations. Thing, yeah, <laughs> and the other thing with DC that it's it's not good for is well, killing people perversely, which is one of the things that Edison tried to like set it up for. Yes, the war of the currents. 
was uh, making sure that the first electric chairs were DC so that he could uh, could point to them and be like, I see this fucking Westinghouse shit will kill you. No, and AC. Um, they were oh, AC, fuck. not DC. Fuck. All right, well, uh, the reverse of everything I just said. Not AC, not DC, but the secret third thing. <laughs> just uh, question mark C. I was reading. I was reading a book while well, we're killing time, waiting for Liam to come back. While well, 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 I'm vamping, yeah, yeah. I know, right? I was reading. I a, forgot to hit on mute. I've been here oh, for like three I, minutes. God damn oh, it. God damn it. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll tell that anecdote on another video. Anyway. I'm kind of curious about the. He, an, no, I'm not going to keep you. No, no. It's something I read in a book recently that made me mad about electricity. Hmm. Someone referred to the Milwaukee Road electrification as three phase DC. And I was like, can't be three phase DC. DC doesn't have phases. Well, it's one phase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, no, it doesn't have any All phases. Because yeah. it's, 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 it doesn't alternate. Yeah, that's the phase. The right. phase is it goes. That's the one phase. No, because the phase, single phase implies you're alternating at a frequency. Oh, God damn it. Okay, fine. Yeah. Zero phases. Yes. It's, 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 I don't it's know no anything about electricity. Yeah. Yes. Anyway. Really? Keep up the good work, and thank you from a non-electrified listener. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. That's a, that's a gas stove supporter right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, our next episode will be on Chernobyl. Uh, does anyone have any commercials before we go? No, but we do have business after this. Yes. All right. We got, we got a Patreon. Uh, you had an ad for it already. This is the ad yes. for it again. Subscribe. We have to a, it, another bonus episode out soon. Yes. Recording that uh, tomorrow. It yes, will, it exactly. The thing will happen. Yes. Um, no. the, the, the podcast continues. Um, all right. That, that was it then. Why safe? Yes. Yep. I'm Scott Manley. <laughs> <laughs> Fly safe. All right, that was a podcast. All right. Yeah. And the recording. I'm, I'm ending. It. Ended. I'm ending it. No, it's still going. If I could find it's, it, it's see, he's top left. It's still going. No, no, I gotta find the the, the browser window. I know. Where's it's the browser window? Oh, there.